Hi there, Victor Braun speaking to you, anarchist artist. Okay. I have recently had a debate with Jan Helfeld, famous for springing the Socratic method on unsuspecting politicians, especially on the federal level. Now, the debate was about anarchism. Or it was supposed to be about anarchism versus limited government. But it became pretty much what you can expect from Hellfield when dealing with anarchists. A philosophical train wreck. <laughs> it is so fucking frustrating. Uh, sure, when dealing with scumbag politicians and senators and state apologists, he is often compelling uh, with the Socratic method, often uh, pushing his unsuspecting subjects into a logical corner, much to their embarrassment and anger. And whenever I first encountered uh, Hellfeld, I was rooting for him. And those were there's a lot of great, great golden moments that the man has when he's uh, dealing with these scumbag uh, politicians. But when dealing with anarchists, Jan Helfeld becomes this cynical, duping sophist. He goes from the Socratic method to becoming a sophist. Now, if you're listening to this video, I suspect you know who Jan Helfeld is. And you might have uh, listened to my recent debate with him. I don't know. Maybe you just stumbled across this, this video, but I'll link the uh, the debate that I had with him in the body of the uh, of this video. Uh, perhaps you've heard uh, his debate with other anarchists such as Larkin Rose, Walter Block, Daniel Rothschild, uh, and Stefan Molyneux. Now with those debates, uh, Helfeld clearly, consistently exhibits a one-trick pony tactic employing the same tactics in each and every debate which is the confounding lifeboat scenarios. It's endless debate tactic and style is with these lifeboat scenarios. Now, drumming up lifeboat scenarios might be entertaining. Uh, might be an entertaining pastime, you know, like playing a crossword puzzle or trying to figure out a Rubik's cube. But it has nothing to do with the, the debate between anarchists and minarchists. Lifeboat scenarios have nothing to do between the anarchists and the minarchists. That is not what the problem is about, is lifeboat scenarios that can be drummed up out of uh, one's ass and thrown and targeted at anybody, whatever their political stripe, to dupe them. That doesn't honestly and sincerely and adequately and appropriately deal with the clash between the minarchists and the anarchists. What is the clash between the anarchists and the minarchists in the first place? Well, we can look at some surface uh, similarities where there is agreement on, on a surface level. Uh, both embrace personal liberty and support individual rights the anarchists and the minarchists, on a surface level, both uh, embrace personal liberty and support individual rights. That's great. That's, that's wonderful. Both sides agree that no government should initiate force. No individual has the right to initiate force. And a government does not have special rights over and above the rights of individuals. That is the position of limit, limited government libertarians. And that is where the anarchist stands. And that's wonderful. We can come together on that. But what is the clash? Now the core focus of the debate between the anarchists and the minarchists is whether a government must initiate force in the course of sustaining its monopoly. Okay? Please, <laughs> try to understand this. I don't want to... Uh, I know I, like I'm, I sound like I'm spoon-feeding this, and, you know, I don't mean to be condescending, but <laughs> if you're a minarchist, or if you're an anarchist, and you're listening to this video, you know, I, I, please listen to me. Please, please understand the clash between the anarchist and the minarchist. I've, you know, we've acknowledged the things that we have in, in common. That's wonderful. Let's 
let's just cover it again. Both sides agree that a government should not initiate force. No government has the right to initiate force, and a government does not have special rights over and above the rights of individuals. That's the position of the limited uh, government advocates, and that's where the anarchists could very well go along with that, of course, naturally. But the clash, what is the clash? What's the conflict? The core focus of the debate, to repeat again, is whether a government must initiate force in the course of sustaining its monopoly. Minarchists say no, and anarchists say yes. There is no government unless this institution is initiating force. All the minarchists can do from that point is to, uh, is to divert the issue and talk about all the disastrous consequences of uh, uh, if anarchy uh, was to take place in, in, the, in, in a stateless society. Uh, they can speak in, of utilitarian pragmatism and <laughs> talk about all the disastrous uh, consequences there, uh, therein. They're, they're fine to, to, uh, to drum all this, uh, this, uh, these hellish scenarios out of their ass, but they're, they're avoiding the crucial conflict. They're, in, they're, they're avoiding fundamental starting principles. First principles is the question of initiatory violence. We have to bring it back to that and make that the focus. Now, in regards to just going back to the hell-filled tactic of avoiding this clash and dealing with everything else, lifeboat scenarios and bullshit, which is completely avoiding the nature of the clash. And the, the debate was supposed to be between anar uh, anarchism versus minarchism, but uh, we, we fell right into the uh, bullshit uh, lifeboat scenario situations. Now, it's particularly grotesque and ironic that he would do so, considering the fact that he is a fan of Ayn Rand, and uh, Rand dismissed uh, this lifeboat scenario, college dorm, pizza-eating, uh, all-night frat house, smoke, smoking weed uh, bowl sessions that that uh, Philosophy 101 students have with their little bullshit uh, trolley cart uh, scenarios and situational ethics and, and all of that. But uh, <laughs> Hellfeld uh, just embraces it. He relies to it. He relies on it, rather. Now, Rand dismissed this, which is very critical of lifeboat uh, scenarios uh, being drummed up at uh, somebody in, in, in a uh, confounding... Uh, uh, ethical conundrum uh, kind of uh, way. And uh, reading from her, just a quick passage from The Ethics of Emergencies in, her, in the book uh, The Virtue of Self the Selfishness, she writes, and listen to this, this is very insightful, speaks to the mind of Hellfield. Quote, The psychological results of altruism may be observed in the fact that a great many people approach the subject of ethics by ask, asking such questions as, should one risk one's life to help a man who is A, drowning, B, trapped in a fire, C, stepping in front of a speeding truck, D, hanging by his fingernails over an abyss? Consider the implications of that approach. If a man accepts the ethics of altruism, he suffers the following consequences in proportion to the degree of his acceptance. Number one, lack of self-esteem, since his first concern in the realm of values is not how to live his life, but how to sacrifice it. Two, lack of respect for others, since he regards mankind as a herd of doomed beggars crying for somebody's help. Three, and this is particularly relevant to Hellfield, a nightmare view of existence, since he believes that men are trapped in a benevolent universe where disasters are the constant and primary concern of their lives. Four, and in fact, a lethargic indifference to ethics, a hopelessly cynical amorality, since his questions involve situations which he is not likely ever to encounter, 
which bear no relation to the actual problems of his own life, and thus leave him to live without any moral principles whatsoever. Unquote. Very relevant. <laughs> Very relevant. Very key passage from that, uh, from that article. Now from probing so uh, Socratic method to manipulative uh, demagoguery and sophistry, Hellfield practices the whole range of methods of manufacturing moral doubt. When it comes to Jan's uh, dealing with anarchists, his whole modus operandi is fucking to instill moral doubt into the listeners. Especially when it comes to uh, anarchist philosophy and the, and the non-aggression principle, upon which the very conception of a stateless society depends. It is hell, that, that, is Hellfield's, that is what it, Hellfield wants to blur in, in the a mist of obfuscation. Now, I received many messages from people asking me about my estimate of the uh, Hellfield versus Prost debate, and in this video I will be taking on Hellfield's uh, debating emergency ethic tactics, which Aqualite Ayn Rand called cynicism, as we just covered, and uh, which I called Jan Hellfield's Venus flytrap a sophistry. I think the title of this video uh, gives you a, a clue of my estimation already. I think I did pretty well during that debate, given the fact that Hellfield's questions were designed uh, as such to spring trap me in, in a matter that no matter how one answers, uh, he, the attempt was to invalidate that person, no matter how that person answered uh, his lifeboat uh, scenario questions. Now, even though the, uh, the theme of the debate was anarchism versus limited government, all of Hellfield's debates with anarchists turn into a barrage of lifeboat scenarios and a steady bombardment of ethical conundrums designed to trap the debater in a maze of ethical contradictions, which is meant to invalidate anarchism by proxy. That's exactly what he was trying to do. Now, it's a major uh, leap in logic chop, of course, but uh, yeah, I do give credit to Jan for having uh, an imagination, at least. Now, observe that all of Hellfield's nightmarish lifeboat scenarios are are set up within an anarchist stateless society, but somehow are not applicable to people living within a society with a government in place. Lifeboat conundrums are, are not meant to offer moral clarity. They are designed to morally paralyze the victim. And how ironic is it, in a grotesque kind of way, that an alleged objectivist would be arguing lifeboat ethics, <laughs> which are are founded upon the ethics of altruism, of, sa of, of sacrifice. And of course, altruism in this case doesn't mean benevolence and kindness, it means self-sacrifice. And the flip side of altruism, as Rand would tell you, would be the sacrifice of, uh, of others. Either, yourself, either it's a matter of self-sacrifice or you're sacrificing others. That's, that's the uh, that, that's a coin flip that uh, altruism offers you. So, uh, Self-sacrifice, or sacrifice rather, is, is, uh, is the choice that you have to take. Okay, to sacrifice yourself or to sacrifice somebody else. This is the vicious economy that uh, altruism sets, uh, sets up. Rand makes it very clear in all of her writings. All the, all the scenarios are designed in, in such a way as to sacrifice yourself or somebody else. All of Hellfield's uh, lifeboat situations involve either sacrificing yourself or, in some measure, sacrificing somebody else. So, as I say, it's very rather, it's rather ironic that a proto, uh, pseudo, quasi objectivist uh, would be embracing lifeboat scenarios since the uh, rest upon the ethics of altruism. No rationality and third way options. Kill or be killed. That's that's what Hellfield was offering up. Now, speaking of uh, of context, now we 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 hear uh, Hellfield in a lot of different uh, commentary and videos speaking about context. I don't know, a lot of people probably will. Well, what the hell is he talking about? But I'll I'll try to explain that in. Uh, 
uh, in this uh, in this video. Now, there's a very interesting uh, section in Leonard Peikoff's Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, that speaks to this issue of context. So let's uh, let's read into some of that. Quote. Now, Peikoff writes, moral principles are guides to life-sustaining action that apply within a certain framework of conditions. Like all scientific generalizations, therefore, moral principles are absolutes within their conditions. They are absolutes contextually. For example, a man is obliged to be, a, uh, to be self-supporting, but... This does not make it wrong for a college student, even one who is well out of his teens, to be supported by his parents, assuming that their help involves no self-sacrifice self and that the student is actually studying. In such a case, the student is not defaulting on independence, but preparing himself to meet its demands. Virtue presupposes the process of human growth and education. They cannot be invoked out of context as dogma in a void. Another example here pertains to the virtue of integrity. A man is obliged to practice what he preaches when he has the political freedom to do it, but he has no obligation to preach or practice any idea that would invite the attention, say, of the Gestapo or the IRS. The same approach applies to the interpretation of honesty. The principle of honesty in the objectivist view is not a divine commandment or a categorical imperative, it does not state that lying is wrong in itself, and thus under all circumstances, even when a kidnapper asks where one's child is sleeping, uh, the Kantians do interpret honesty in this way, by the way, but one may not infer that honesty is therefore situational and that every lie must be judged on its own merits without reference to principle. Now, this kind of alternative, which we hear everywhere, is false. So anyway, just to put it, uh, just just to elaborate on what Peikoff is talking about here, and I absolutely agree. Yeah, the, the, uh, this is where the, uh, the issue becomes muddied with relativistic uh, uh, ethics. Uh, ethical relativism basically would say that, uh, well, is lying, would ask the question, is lying wrong? Well, it depends upon the situation, right? But they're not guided by principle. See, here we, here we have, okay, the principle. The principle is lying is wrong. It is absolutely wrong but within a context, and that is not relativism. Let's say that the, uh, the context is, is that you're going for a job. You lie your ass off <laughs> to get the job. Uh, that's going to eventually explode in your face. You know, you have this constant ba battle uh, with reality, you know, and you will lose in the end. But let's say that uh, the, the situation is, as he gives in this, uh, uh, in this section, that uh, you're lying... Uh, because, uh, to uh, safeguard your child. You're lying to the would-be kidnapper. It's a completely different situation. Okay, The first scenario is, is that you're trying to dupe somebody to gain a value at their expense by lying to them about your credentials for a certain job. Okay, It's deceptive. Okay, And in this case, uh, in the case of the kidnapper, you're trying to save <laughs> your child's life, right? So uh, that's the difference. That's the difference between relativistic uh, ethics and uh, and contextual ethics. Okay, you know, like take the uh, the non uh, the non or the non-aggression principle for example. You know, what's the context? You do not initiate violence. Okay, ever. That is the moral absolute. You do not initiate violence against other people. You you, you do not start the use. But uh, if you were to ask the same question in such a way as that, should you kill somebody? Well, what's the context? Are they coming at you to threaten your life? Well, then, sure, you can kill somebody if need be. There's a lot of other things you could do. You can maim the person. You could run away. You can flee them or whatever. But if it comes, push comes to shove, yeah, in, 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 the, t in the sense of self, immediate self-defense, yeah, you can kill somebody if they're trying to kill you. Uh, so uh, that, that's the whole point there. Now, 
let's go back to the uh, the issue of the of, of the bait. Uh, for example, now a prototypical question Jan Helfield will ask when taking the plunge into uh, his ethical conundrum tactics is the following: You are alone in uh, in the woods and you're dying of thirst. You see, and you come across a home in this nowhere to be found land, and the property owner has a, a well filled with fresh sparkling water. And the question is, do you violate the man's r property rights? And I answered no. A lot of uh, a lot of people who are very sympathetic towards my position, who are themselves uh, libertarians or anarchists, they just said, "Oh, for God's sakes, you know, why didn't you? You're, you know, the scenario was that you're dying of thirst and uh, take the goddamn water and throw yourself before the mercy of a court or whatever, or pay." for damages or admit that you were wrong afterwards or whatever, but I I was just applying uh, the objectivist um, epistemology uh, into the situation. Uh, first of all, they're highly unrealistic scenarios, and even Rand agrees with that. Uh, they're ridiculously unreal. I mean, I'm out there in the woods and I'm dying, you see, I'm dying of thirst. It really is that bad. And I'm in the woods where apparently there's civilization, uh, so there's nobody else that lives in the nearby vicinity. I can't ask the guy, uh, this guy that has a sparkling well of fresh water, if uh, where can can you tell me where I can go? Uh, can you make a phone call for me? Or you know, there's there's, there's it's just uh, Jan Hellfield's. Uh, it, it just comes down to yes or no. Do you steal the water or do you die? Or do you die? Steal the water or die? Die, steal the water, die. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else I can do, right? Nothing else I can do. So it's a bullshit uh, scenario. Then the other one, of course, is that you know you're you're drowning. Okay, and this is a completely different context than being lost in the woods, right? Uh, you're you're uh, I'm I'm drowning, and uh, death is certainly immediate and and certain, unlike being in the woods, right? Because uh, there I am, I can't swim, and I'm drowning. A boat comes by. Do I violate the guy's property rights by clinging on side of the boat? And uh, let's say the guy doesn't want you there. He's beating you off with his uh, his, his paddle. Uh, you know. So the question is, is like, uh, you know, uh, do you violate property rights or do you die? Once again, you know, violate somebody's rights or die. See, this this is the hell-filled, nightmarish uh, universe, right? Well, let's look at the context of this, okay? How is it that I'm violating his property rights? I'm trying to save my life, for Christ's sakes. And even the person uh, who's uh, beating me off with a stick, he doesn't seriously perce perceive me as a threat to him, as somebody who's attempting to uh, violate his property rights. I'm, 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 I'm vulnerable. I'm dying. I'm fucking drowning. How am I a threat to this person's property rights? So of course it's it's bullshit. It's both. It, it's it's just pathetic bullshit. To get back to the issue of of uh, of anarchism and minarchism, as I've established, both sides can agree that no government should initiate force. And if so, you know why? Because no individual has the right to initiate force, and a government does not have special rights over and above the rights of individuals. This is the shared premise of both the anarchist and the objectivist styled minarchist. The core focus of the debate is whether a government must initiate force in the course of sustaining its monopoly. That is the only fucking topic and focus of, of any debate that an anarchist should have with a minarchist. And as I've said, minarchists say no, anarchists say yes. A government must initiate force to sustain its monopoly, thus violating property rights, thus violating individual rights, thus violating NAP. It's not just a Hellfield who will, uh, you know, bend the language and play out these uh, bullshit lifeboat scenarios. Any minarchist will pull out every form of evasion and verbal gymnastics to elude this core question. And how does Hellfeld do it? He does it, he does it by sophistry. He does it by lifeboat uh, scenarios. And the other verbal gymnastics that uh, other minarchists will employ, you just have to be very mindful of it and never get off track what the crucial, cla the crucial clash is 
between the minarchist and the anarchist has shit fuck all to do with light boat uh, scenarios. This is Victor Pross, anarchist artist, pop goes to culture. Share this video, comment on this video. I'd love to hear from you. Subscribe to my channel. I would appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.